everybody for attending our webinar about uh, data co-ops, data cooperatives. Um, and as you'll know, if you attended the last webinar that I was involved in, um, we like to connect things. And uh, this webinar is about connecting with data. Um, so uh, we have obtained funding from the Australian Research Council and other partners to build a data cooperative platform. And that's what we'll be discussing today, including how you can get involved and how this could be useful for your work. I'll do a little bit of talking. Uh, I'm Jane Farmer. I'm director of the Social Innovation Research Institute and member of CSI at Swinburne University of Technology. Um, most of the talk will be given by Dr. Amir Ariani, who's a data scientist and director of our social data analytics lab at Swinburne. Next. So first of all, uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, falls to me to give a little bit of background also about CSI. Um, CSI is a national research and education centre. We operate out of three partner universities, Swinburne, the University of Western Australia and UNSW in Sydney. We produce research that catalyzes social change and we're the leading provider of undergraduate courses and postgraduate programs in social impact. More than that though, we aim to build capacity in the social purpose sector and bring people together to create social change. You can find out more at csi.edu.au. Next. So what is a data cooperative or collaborative? And there are some other terms that are used around this topic as well. That you might come across. But it's really a new form of collaboration in which participants collaborate with their data and their data capabilities to create collective impact. This is a new space that is emerging around the world and its potential for NGOs, communities and collaborations involving communities, NGOs and corporates um, is only beginning to be discovered. Next. So a little bit of background. Um, these are the different points, I guess, that have led us to uh, want to explore data cooperatives. So first of all, um, the rise of data analytics and big data. Um, it'd be hard to avoid having heard about these topics, um, but we do hear about these mainly in relation to corporates. Um, and we're really interested in exploring the potential of data analytics and data science for insights into social challenges and working with the sector uh, to build appropriate tools for dealing with these. Secondly, it's tied in with the rise of collective impact, the rise of social impact bonds and like initiatives. Collaborating with data can be a way of understanding beyond a single organization's operations. So if we consider working in a community, then obviously there are multiple organizations um, and community groups that will be contributing to impact in different ways and perhaps some more than others. And working together with data can help us to understand uh, the nature of the community, the nature of its challenges and how each organization individually and together is making impact. And thirdly, thinking about place-based planning and outcomes measurement, data cooperatives can help with the, uh, with the notion that sometimes there is insufficient data at a sufficiently granular scale to understand what's happening in individual communities. If organizations work together with data, they can build rich pools of evidence about places and they can help to identify indicators uh, that ac accurately depict or indicate the points that they're seeking to change rather than having outcomes measurements inflicted upon them. Um, in terms of the competition that is uh, becoming more prevalent in the space, um, we see data cooperatives as a way of collaborating. Um, so funding mechanisms all too often set community organizations up to compete with each other, where collaborating with data is a space where organizations can work together while still being separate. Data co-ops and collaboratives could even be spaces in which to collaborate collaboratively leverage new sources of funding. And finally, we have a, a mission and a passion bring that the community and social sector is every bit as at the forefront and data savvy as corporates. Next. 
Um, so there's a, a decent kind of provenance behind this work. Two organizations internationally have done a lot of work in this space and really got the ball, ball rolling and are um, useful for us to learn from. Um, particularly Nesta in the UK and the GovLab at New York University. Nesta's work on collective intelligence basically highlighted the massive amount of la latent data that exists, for example, open data sets, organizations own data sets, information that hasn't previously been regarded as data, such as qualitative data from social media, or even things like notes of community meetings, and also being on the front foot uh, to be able to use emergent data, such as from sensors, internet of things, and so on. And the idea of Nesta is to bring all of these data together for new insights about social challenges. Similarly, the GovLab's datacollaboratives.org website has links to numerous data co-ops on different topics, such as food security, early childhood outcomes, and the environment, and so on. It also has great resources on how to build and use a data co-op. And we have strong alliances with both of these organizations. Next. I'm just going to show you um, two or three slides that are some early um, experiments that we've had with partners and using data. So this first one was working with the Australian Red Cross. Um, what we did here was to um, look at some spatial data about areas, uh, the Red Cross's own data about volunteering and donations, and overlay it with Instagram data about um, people's motivations and behaviours and the photographs that they might use uh, to show their volunteering. And so what we were able to do here was to show any gaps between um, people's volunteering uh, actions and the things that were motivating them and what Red Cross already knew about its volunteers. And this helped to inform the Red Cross's volunteering strategy. Next. And we also have done some work for the Victorian Government Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, they had a particular interest in what was happening as a result of the um, Victorian family violence policy. And uh, they, they had a whole uh, beautiful grid of outcomes, but they were um, a little um, lack of data to help them understand and measure these outcomes. So we experimented with a range of different data sets that could help give some insights, um, for example, Twitter data, and also a source called um, Media Cloud from MIT. And we looked at the conversation and family violence and how it had changed since the Victorian Commission for Family Violence and um, the Victorian government's policy. We were able to tell the Victorian government uh, the ways that the public conversation had changed and the kinds of activities that uh, motivated change and dis uh, excited discussion. The next slide. So as well as looking at topics in data, we can also look at changes over time in data. And essentially this slide is just another slide for the Victorian government's um, family violence policy, looking at what events um, over time uh, sort of stimulated um, conversation in Twitter and um, the length of duration of um, these kinds of discussions. So as I say, these are just some early examples of um, looking at kind of latent data, if you like, and starting to use it to address uh, social problems, which the data weren't obviously available. And I'm going to hand over to Amir to talk about the technicalities and talk us through a worked example. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for a wonderful introduction to the whole data co-op era. Uh, well, what I can add to this is that uh, if, we, if we want to get back to the principles of the creating a data cooperative platform and then looking at what do we need to do a data projects like this, obviously data is the basically the main ingredient. When you do the data co-op, you would need data. And data comes from different sources. You can have data from the public sources, you can have private sources. For data cooperative, you obviously need more than one data set. So that's when you bring data from different platforms. However, the, the center point of the data co-op are people. 
the domain experts, policymakers, community leaders, data scientists, they all come together for a purpose. Data co-op often around a main goal, and the goal can be the social impact, community impact, better outcome for communities, uh, changing the policies, better planning for the government. Uh, there, is a, there is a goal that actually motivates and drives the data co-op, and that's very, very important, because without that, the data co-op is just a, a, a shiny toy, a very good data exercise, but doesn't actually have any social impact. And obviously you need analytics capabilities. That's usually where universities come to play. We uh, contribute to artificial intelligence, high performance computing, advanced analytics. Basically universities are like, like a supporting ground from both data science perspective, but also from some of the social science and policy making domain expertise. Now, uh, as Jane mentioned, uh, we have uh, funding from Australian Research Council and a partnership with five universities that we are building a platform for data co-op. This is actually started last year, even prior to funding. So we have an infrastructure in place that already supports some of our projects. But the way that it works, it, the data co-op has a, a uh, we call it an iterative met uh, methodology. Basically, you start from some data, the data that comes from the open sources usually, and then you take this data to the stakeholders with the initial, but initial some ideas, like uh, identifying some questions, having some idea about opportunities, and the workshop is really where the conversation shapes. You basically take the data to them and then start the conversation on how this data can actually make a difference, how it can help them to gain insight, and how it can actually provide input into their main operation. It's, if it's a business unit, how it's going to change their business operation. Now, the output of those workshops often end up to be que more questions, and sometimes it ends up with a more data requirements. So you often end comes out of those uh, workshops with questions about, can we get access to this data? Can we actually have that data set? How we can actually map these data sets across each other? Those questions go to data engineers and data team, and usually the outcome of one of these iterations would be a data package that have a set of information linked together, but also it produce data products, which are often are business intelligence packages, like an interactive dashboard, that all of those stakeholders can work with this. The infrastructure that James mentioned, it has embedded AI and the data analytics platform that basically led us to do this exercise very quickly. We quickly find the data, we quickly link the data, and we very rapidly generate business intelligence dashboards that led us to actually basically get that conversation rolling. Now, uh, all of this activity needs to be done in the kind of like umbrella of responsible data sharing model. And this has been the work that we were kind of very, very much mindful of this from the beginning of this uh, data co-op exercise. Uh, working with data is a sensitive topic, and we need to have a partnership based, that's based on trust, but also is based on certain principles. In the data co-op platform, currently we are following the data commissioner guideline. This is the five states model that is endorsed by the Australian government. It initially came from UK, and uh, in government has been adopted as a way for government units and also external parties who can actually exchange information. Things to consider is usually is based on the five main pillars or five, five states model, the names goes for it. So there, there, there is a, there's a whole bunch of questions that needs to be answered under each umbrella. When you create a project like this, you need to identify that these are the safe group of people to work with this project. Have they done their ethics? Is it a sensitive data set that we need security clearance? So there is different variables goes to play to actually identify these are the safe group of people for this project. Obviously, the project needs to be safe in a way that the outcome or expectation from the project aligns with the uh, ethics and the basic expectations of all the participants. Also, it should not compromise privacy or any uh, vulnerable communities as a result of the project. The, the settings of the project to be safe really resonate to the things like, well, do we need to have the uh, policy for storing the data in Australia? Can we hold the data in a a commercial entity. What are the security uh, uh, settings or uh, infrastructures required to keep the data safe and so forth? Now, when we get to the safe data, we're assuming that everything that we have considered so far has 
could go wrong and they may go wrong in that sense how the data can protect itself. Do we need to de-identify the data? Do we need to have a data aggregation? Is there any other way that we actually need to protect this data if it compromised? And once you have the project finished, you would have some outcomes from the project, often in the form of publications or things like interactive dashboards. What are the policies and managements around disseminating that information? So managing the output of the project is part of the element for the entire project in the first place. So uh, on that note, uh, we did one of these projects from very early days with the city of Glen Ira. That was one of our kind of flagship projects at the time and it still is one of our main partnerships in this space. Uh, the, the Glen Ira project started with the idea of understanding what communities and needs and what they want and how does it actually align with the uh, um, government planning and very soon it emerged the conversation around measuring the social resilience and identifying the social vulnerability and in the scope of this project we basically brought different business units inside the local governments we formed a workshop with them to identify what is it that they really want? What information are available? And how we can actually, with that information, provide insights that actually change their business model in a way that actually match the community needs in that space. Now, when you use a platform like what we have, you get a couple of advantages that are kind of activities that might be very tedious to do by hand or manually, but when you use machines, are incredibly easy to do at larger scale. So one of the things that the machines they do in this space, they go across all different social variables and try to find correlation. What correlation means is something like this. It is a, a this is actually at, across the entire Glen Ira. One of the things that machines told us, which in the in face value is nothing, but starting from this point takes us to a very interesting path of finding relations across the uh, social fabric of people in that space. So what we found is that for a lot of properties, there is a direct correlation between the ownership of the property and having two cars. That means the probability of owning a property would be much, much higher if someone tells you I have two cars and I live in Glen Ira and vice versa. If you actually uh, know a person lives in Glen Ira and owns a property, it's more likely that that person owns two cars. Now why this is important is that lo looking at this kind of correlation between patterns helps us to find what we call data proxies. When we don't know something, but we can find something else in that space that resonates the problem. Think about this. If we know that, and this is a hypothetical statement, it's not actually the case, but if we know that there is a direct correlation between being a student in that area and having a mental health problem or having a loneliness problem, then if you don't know who actually have the loneliness uh, challenge in that space, you would go and target your uh, policy and planning for students focusing on them because that's where you can have a majority of the impact in place. Now, we do this at larger scale and uh, with that we basically use, uh, as I said, we use AI system and then we use a statistical modeling. This is just a small corner of a very, very big matrix. It has like 15,000 variables across the whole matrix that basically the red dots are, core, are negatively correlated and blue dots means they are correlated. That means people with these characteristics are living together. And we often look for basically the blocks in this. We look for the uh, uh, clumps of communities and that's where we can actually detect uh, certain groups. Now, uh, although this might be interesting from data science point of view, but may not have any real impact, uh, to make it translatable and useful for the actual stakeholders, that information will be transformed to things like this. This is one of our dashboards that looks at the social vulner uh, vulnerability. Uh, across the Glen Ira, using the same model we identified, there are eight main factors that are basically driving the social vulnerability in that space. The orange box in the middle, it is actually the average for Glen Ira. And the gray one is average for Victoria. So Glen are doing better than Victoria. And then you could actually click on every single council and identify what is the situation. Uh, basically having the not, not being fully employed, not having emergency money, having a low income, low education. If you are new to the neighborhood, this is really resonates to the social connections. 
If you are international immigrants, that has proven to be one of the factors in that space. If you have a disability and you have, and also aging. So well, in a worst case scenario, you can think about one household that have different people in it and all have one or two of these uh, factors in place, but usually, usually that's not the case. Uh, this also can be zoomed at the individual statistical area, which is almost like a block of multiple households. And then that's where you start getting a better planning of what can be done in that space. Now, when we have those conversations and then we build charts like this, often the units uh, or communities, they will say, okay, well, we want to do more. And one of the things came out of this, one of the examples of our projects uh, was identifying the households in the rental stress. So in this case, uh, the part of Glen Ira was working on planning that supports households with rental stress, and they wanted to know where they are, who they are, how we can actually reach them. So the, the overall statistics shows about there are 1,500 households in that area, which is substantial. But you can actually select the map, the area in the top corner, and then that would tell you that, well, just in the Carnegie area, that area is actually Carnegie's suburb uh, in Victoria. In that space, there are 760 households in the rental stress compared to the 1500 in the entire Glen Ira. So if you start your planning and focus on that space, you would get much better impact on, uh, on, the, on the investment that uh, that entity is doing. Now, we went through the, so many of these exercises and Jane can tell you more about the outcome variables and the council motivation of being involved in this. I think on that note, I want to pass this to Jane and she will tell you more. Okay, is there a next slide? <laughs> yes, there is. Oh, well, go back to the previous one. Oh. So just to finish about Glen Ira, in case you're wondering what was it all about, I think there was two main motivations for this. One, as Amir says, was really for them to get a bit more granular about where to target their um, services and basically find out a bit more about um, what was going on in their council area where the, where the key places of need were. Um, I think they had a lot of assumptions about need and these data um, analytics enabled them to understand whether their assumptions were borne out or whether things were completely different. As Amir said, they did find a number of proxy measures um, in this whole process, which was really, really interesting. and. Um, I won't go into it now, but, but kind of fascinating. Um, I think the other thing that they wanted to do with this exercise was use it with the councillors. So um, they, they also felt that the councillors were coming to this process, again, with a lot of assumptions and possibly, dare I say, opinions um, that weren't necessarily borne out in the data. And so this was a really great way of um, visualising data. So. Um, one of, one of the really powerful things I think about data analytics, as I'm sure you guys have found out yourselves, is um, the capacity to show these things visually and interactively. Um, and so it was something that the councillors could get involved in um, uh, without too much kind of pre-reading or pre-effort. Um, okay, so that, so that was where we're at with Glen Ira, I think. Um, then, as Amir said, um, since we got the ARC funding, we've um, started to look at a number of uh, data collaborative or data co-op projects. Um, and these involve the different interests of the different university partners and the industry partners that they're working with. So um, one that I and myself and Amir are leading in Bern is around um, mental health and well-being. And right now we're working with uh, a regional city in Victoria around setting up uh, a regional city wellbeing data co-op. Um, what's happened there is that basically the council, a number of health services and a number of community organisations have kind of got together. We've done a couple of talks and workshops with them and they're, they have decided that they're interested in this. Interestingly, also a big corporate that and um, works in the city is also interested in participating. So we potentially are going to be able to incorporate some um, consumer data uh, and market data as well. Um, and so the different layers that we will have in this initially will be um, open data, uh, data from uh, not-for-profits and the community and industry, 
Um, we potentially can put in social media data that gives us that kind of qualitative uh, layer. And um, we, we plan to put in data about need, um, data about service use, and also um, some basic data about the community just to start off with. And then as Amir indicated for Glen Ira, the kinds of um, where people want to drill down further kind of tends to come out of that kind of initial process. Um, so uh, particular things the community are interested in just now are um, relationships between digital inclusion and well-being, which is not too surprising in COVID. Um, they're also interested in climate change and the impacts that climate change is going to have over time and whether there's particularly risky areas of the community. And, um, and they're interested in food security and access to healthy food. So these will be data sets that we'll also look at putting into the data co-op over time. And next. And so just to uh, finish up by talking about the future. Um, so uh, data collectives can obviously be used in a variety of different um, spaces and for different initiatives. I think we're particularly interested in, in exploring these different ways that data co-ops can be used. Um, so in the community development space, for example, the community can get involved in data co-ops and in these workshopping processes, and that can be a way of bringing the community together around a challenge. Um, we're interested in how these uh, can be used in collective impact projects. Um, I think a really good example of this that's, uh, that already exists is in Shepparton with the Shepparton Lighthouse project. Um, we're also really interested in whether um, data co-ops can help to feed the information that is required by impact bonds and um, place-based collaborative working. Uh, I guess we're also interested in being on the front foot all the time for new kinds of data that might come along. Um, and we know that uh, things like VR, um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed and hybrid reality are things that people are talking about. If you think about those things, they're going to generate huge amounts of data. Um, and so it's of interest to understand, is that a source of data that could be used? Also sensor data, for example, with uh, things like traffic um, and uh, relationships between uh, pollution and humans walking around in the community. Uh, we're, we're really interested in the potential of collaborative AI for social goods. So we know that AI has a really bad reputation and AI has tended to be inflicted upon people in the past by um, governments or, or corporates. So again, we're really interested in working with uh, community sector organizations to get them savvy and on the front foot and exploring if the potential of AI for social good. And working with community partners, as I said right at the start, is really important for us because we're really in the sector so that um, community organizations can uh, work in a really knowledgeable, intelligent way in this space rather than having to just go and buy the services of consultants, um, uh, the big four or whatever, who basically once you start working with them kind of own you and potentially um, your data. Um, and so essentially, I guess the benefits of working with the university in this space are the sort of access to ongoing um, research and capacity building, the fact that every project we do has to go through absolutely rigorous ethics. Um, and it's a great space to experiment and try these things out and see if they really are for you or your organization or community without a huge amount of commitment to the future. So if you are interested at all in getting involved in a data co-op um, or simply finding out more, um, we've put on the end there our expression of interest uh, form link. So um, do get in touch. And I think we are now ready to hand over to Rhonda to manage the Q&A. Yes, hi, thank you everyone. Um, I'll admit I didn't know anything about this topic before we started, but now I do. <laughs> So That's thank good. you. <laughs> that was really, I probably wouldn't become an expert in it, but it was a um, great explanation. Thank you very much. Um, so I've actually just copied that EOI URL into the chat box. Might be a little bit easier for everyone if you're keen. Um, so we'll start with a few questions. A few have come through, but feel free to add more um, into the chat box. 
Um, and Jane and Amir, you might like to open that chat box, but I'll just go through the ones that have come through. So um, from Kynan, I think I'm saying that right. He's actually got two, but they relate to each other. Is the Family Violence Data Initiative stepping up? DHHS have seen significant increase in AU, Australia. However, New Zealand is in a much worse state. Is there an ANZ data collaborative? Uh, look, I don't know. There could be. Um, basically, what we did was uh, a kind of experimental project with the Victorian uh, Department of Premier and Cabinet that involved a number of departments of government and uh, kind of agencies. Um, it was a great kind of co-designed uh, project. As Amir's shown, we went through a number of workshops with data and people started to ask questions and get insights. And um, I guess everyone that was involved in that project uh, expressed their surprise uh, both at the, the affordances of these data sets that they hadn't really thought about being useful before um, they also kind of uh, thought about new ways to measure outcomes um, from that and I guess um, there were quite a lot of surprises for people in terms of uh, yeah their assumptions about what people were thinking and um, and this sort of thinking to acting kind of space um, so yeah, it's, it's basically uh, published as a report on analysis and policy observatory and we await to see what happens next. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you want to add anything else, Amir, on that. Do you know anything else? No, no, I, I'm not uh, aware of any data co-op in that space. So yeah, it's, let's wait and see what kind of feedback we get from the report on the APO. Um, I actually think his second question isn't related, <laughs> slightly different. Um, were there prior councillor assumptions completely disproved by the data sets? Well, I can take that one. Uh, so, uh, yes and no. So there were things that um, we, we knew that this would be the case and it proved to be the case. Uh, but there were also surprises. So this is more like the... Um, evidence-based discussion rather than this discussion-based evidence ma evidence making so we basically even when there was no disprovement there was a better stronger argument about the allocation of resources but there was cases that we found things that it completely changed the equation okay um Brahman has asked could you tell us who the members of a data cooperative typically are is it organizations councils, et cetera, or is there scope for individual membership? And is it legally set up as a state-based cooperative? I think Jane can take that. <laughs> you can answer the last bit about the legal setup. Yeah. Um, look, it, it's, uh, there's a whole lot of different organizations that we're working with at the moment. Um, so for example, I think I noticed one of my colleagues, Kath Albury is uh, in, in the room potentially. And um, so we have a project with the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. And um, there are sort of uh, individual organizations that are working with us through that relationship to start to experiment with, um, with their own data. So typically there, what would happen is um, an organization that hasn't hasn't really done data analytics before but thinks that it has data sets that are relatively clean and relatively usable um, wants to kind of experiment and find out if there's something useful in this space potentially has a particular problem or problem area i mean it's it kind of mad to i guess in a way just kind of go oh we've got data let's see what's in it um, and so what can happen there is to take their organization's data and just start to overlay it with uh, already open data sets. So that, that would typically be one organization using open data. And then it might go on to um, look at the partners that they work with in the community. So um, another example of a data collaborative that, or data co that we're doing at the moment is um, with, it's on rural mental health. And um, we've been working with Beyond Blue and SANE, um, the Royal Flying Doctors and um, uh, Care Opinion. And uh, they have uh, lots of different data sets that they potentially haven't used before, um, such as qualitative data sets as well as quantitative data sets. 
and um, but they, they all have in common uh, a spatial location link so we're we're using that data to obviously at kind of LGA type levels so it's not identifiable to try and to get some rich rich data about um, the relationship between service uh, delivery, apparent service delivery and the experiences of people on the ground. So it's really hard to get that kind of um, data for rural and remote areas because it's so thin. Um, but with working with multiple organisations, we can start to layer that up. Um, and as I said, the Bendigo, oh, I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> the regional city that we're working with, but yes, it's Bendigo, um, has got, uh, you know, council involvement, um, various uh, health organizations and um, uh, other uh, corporate organizations and um, like most of these things I guess require a champion or someone who kind of sees the potential and um, comes in as an individual to kind of work with us and drive that or who goes okay I can see the potential of this for my community and they then sort of harness the different partners that they might work with and kind of bring it in but um I think it's quite good to start with one organization and start layering it on rather than everyone, you know, coming in with hundreds of different data sets. Although I think Amir would totally disagree with me there because he loves to do that. Let's have hundreds <laughs> of data sets and see how they all relate to each other. I don't know, you should answer the one about the legally set up. Uh, yes, well, I can do that. So we are uh, uh, along, uh, so there are two different things. There is uh, individual data co-ops and then there is a data co-op platform. So for the platform, as Jane pointed out, we are working toward creating a not-for-profit organization that actually supports the whole infrastructure and also supports the community. When it gets to the individual data co-op projects, there are often there are a contracts across multiple parties. So the, the one data co-op like the Glen Ira projects or uh, let's say a bushfire data co-op would be really a, like a partnership project across multiple stakeholders. That often doesn't have a separate legal uh, kind of existence. It's just would be a contract across those players. However, that, that's to make it easier for these data co-ops to form, uh, as part of that not-for-profit organizations, we are putting the um, legal pieces in place to make forming the contract much easier and make it much uh, less headache for all the participants to form these sort of things. I'm not sure if you have any of you been involved with the legal office. It's often too expensive and uh, quite a long process of getting one of these things uh, moving. I should also say that one of the questions we get asked a lot is about the openness as opposed to the secure or closeness. Mm -hmm. So you might be an organization um, that wants to work on a data co-op and with us you can make that a secure data co-op so it's just your organization that sees it or you can decide that it could be an open data co-op in which case others and uh, your partners could see it okay are they from anthony are these collaborative initiatives governed by democratic cooperative entities I'll leave this one to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of questions in, in all of this about uh, the data and data ownership and uh, democracy, democratic uh, principles in the data co-op. And um, the way that uh, I have viewed this from the start is um, that these things are super important um, but we can't necessarily stop the, the sort of work um, until we've got everything absolutely right and then do it. It's kind of more a process of, I guess, finding out what the issues are as we go through it and trying to square it off as we go. So um, in terms of each of these data collaboratives or co-ops that we've been working on, I guess the, at the moment the main partners in them would be the organisations that bring the data. But the next step is obviously to um, is obviously to uh, engage the end user in this in this situation as well. So I mean, the, the, in the process of actually working with organisations, there are beginning points even where people go, "Oh, does this data even belong to me?" Like, and that's a huge question as well. Who does the data actually belong to? 
you might think it's between the organization and the end user, but sometimes actually the data seems to belong to a government, which might be the state government or, or whatever. So um, I think the, the idea of us doing this is to work through all of these processes with, um, with a kind of social purpose, social good area of um, mission and uh, to kind of work through these things in steps. Clearly all the organizations that we're working with, ultimately we'd love to bring the end user into the space as well. And certainly with the projects that we're doing with the mental health organizations, we're also going to engage with the end users once we have some visualizations to kind of get their um, views on this from right from the is it okay to do this um, through to the, you know, how do you feel about the ways that this data can be used or should be used? So it's, it's very much that kind of space at the moment. Um, and it is a little bit kind of, I guess, pushing the boundaries, but that's again, why I think it's important to do it in this kind of experimental um, space that's highly governed with ethical processes. A hey, question from Ryan, how should a local government approach a university to partner? What type of faculty do we approach and how do we start that conversation? Um, <laughs> do you want to answer that one, Amir? Yeah, I can do that. So um, uh, on more specifically about the data co-op platform again, uh, so that's that the EOI that I we put on the form. That will be basically the starting of the discussion. There is a steering committee for the platform that basically monitors or kind of overall manages the allocation of resources that we put to our different projects. So the starting point will be you basically submit the EOI, and this is very much at the moment is an evolving process. So we are basically developing this as we go through this. And then we basically get back to you from the comments from the steering committee. But back to the actual university and engagement with the universities. University will not only provide the infrastructure, but also provides research expertise in things like the public policies and social science and public health. So having the research, if you know researchers or you have already approached researchers who have expertise that can be useful in your data co-op, that will be also very good conduit. There's a very, very good way of actually open the conversation. Having them involved in the project, it helps a lot. So it's a multi-angle approach. Uh, let us know that what you think would be a good data co-op and also at the same time, talk to other parties who would be interested in that project. Okay, and this relates, I think, who works on the co-op project? So these data volunteers or are they students or are they employees from unis? Not many students, no, unfortunately or unfortunately, the speed of our work is kind of getting to be in a way that uh, doesn't leave that much time for uh, students at the moment to engage. But the actual development of the platform and a lot of projects that we do, we have a individual data scientists who are working on these projects across all five universities. We also have software developers who are uh, just purely working on infrastructure, so they're not really involved in the data co-op project or really working uh, on the platform. It's almost like someone who is building a train line while, you, uh, while the train is uh, start to pass. So uh, we have those two, two group of people. And then we have the, basically the scientists from social science and health science and other faculties who are involved in the projects across universities. When we get to the, our partners, each of the partners who are involved in the project, they need as someone who Jane mentioned called champion. So we need a champion in, in each organization who helps to form the conversation, basically uh, kind of uh, wrangle all the discussions across that organization. But also uh, we would have people individually from those organizations who separately approach us and then we connect them. So there's a combination of a staff uh, from the organization, a staff from the universities and independent software developers. But uh, I would also say that ultimately the whole idea is to co-produce these things. So we don't want people to depend, be dependent on us at the end of the day. We want to build um, capacity uh, of the people that work with us. Um, I mean, and that sounds a bit patronizing because sometimes they are going to know a lot more about their data than we do. So it's a sort of co-learning experience. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's essentially a kind of uh, co-produced experience at the moment where we 
where we kind of work together. And one thing else uh, on the student parts, this, also, this is also something that's going to change soon. So as we go to the maturity of these projects, there will be open linked data packages that are available for students. So we hope to be able to actually engage the students to use that open data when it is open data co-op, of course. And also at the same time, there will be more opportunity for students to get involved, involved in the data science part of it. So that is something that hopefully is gonna change close to the quarter four of this year. So around maybe October, November. Okay, Marina asked that question and she said, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Lisa asks, does every co-op co -op around a particular issue or topic need to build its own infrastructure to manage and work with the data? or can they repurpose the in infrastructure of existing co-ops? So I think that is the whole point of the infrastructure that we have in place. So you do not need to build your own infrastructure. Uh, uh, from point of the data collection to data management, to data analytics, and then producing data products, all of them are running on the infrastructure that right now is funded by the government. So in a way that is actually removes the burden from the participants in the data co-op, to have a data management capability. It doesn't mean that they cannot, if they want, or if they have in, internal policy to hold some of these things in-house. A part of the data co-op infrastructure is running top of the uh, Nectar, which is a national research cloud, and individual organizations can have a partnership in that place, or even run the version of this in the Amazon cloud if they want. So there is there are options available, but if you do not want to be involved in that capacity, then everything can be managed through the infrastructure. Okay, um, this one's from Chris. How would you navigate the complexities around securing commitment from stakeholders, even if they see and agree with the common goal? For example, how would you get organisations to the table that have sensitive data? Do yeah. you want to go with this? <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I guess the the it's a process, right? So, I mean, I think initially, as we've all been saying, we it needs someone who's excited about the potential and the idea, and they might come in first of all with their data. And then I guess they might be telling their partners, look, we're doing this thing. They might, we might overlay some data, produce some visualizations, and that can then be used to start a conversation where the other partners are at the table, but they've not necessarily at that point committed to doing anything. But there's this kind of working through a process. Um, a lot can be done with open data sets. So there are a whole lot of, obviously, a whole lot of open data sets out there, not just government ones, but um, for example, um, Ask Izzy has open data. Um, and so uh, open data from government can be overlaid with other open data sets and you can start to sort of build a picture and show the potential through that with, with essentially no one committing to putting their data in. Um, I mean, then there's, there's other situations. I remember back at the start when we were working with some um, social and community services, they, were, they came along with, their, with data that was um, not sensitive, such as um, where are our services? and where are our staff and where are different services provided and so in that situation you could look at demographics and transport um, disadvantage and so on and you could put on where are the services being provided and there's surprise much surprisingly to me a conversation sparked about oh we're maybe not providing these the right services in the right place which then kind of leads people to think about the kind of more detailed questions they might start to ask. So I think, I think it's a process of kind of um, building up and I think that's understandable. You know, it's, it's incremental, like, like all good normal sort of community development type, type work, I think is. Uh, Rhonda, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. I just said, is there anything you would like to add about that? Sorry, what? Is there anything you'd like to add in after Jane? Uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the big build up there. Um, so I actually have one last question. So if anyone has um, any other questions, please pop them in the chat box. Um, and the last one's from Carla and it probably applies and is a great one to end on. Um, so she's very interested in the topic, but she's not really in a space where her organisation is ready to engage. 
Um, is there any way she can follow updates, progress, info about these things so she can re-engage later? Okay, so a uh, couple of things that the, we, uh, we have the, the social media channel on the Twitter and LinkedIn. So I'll actually post those things later in the chat box. And uh, also the other thing here is that uh, the, the data co-op website, there is a data co-op uh, landing page, that's datacoop.com.au. So I'll put all of these things in the chat box later on. You, you would start to see some of these open data co-ops pop, pops up. And the open data co-ops are probably the best way to engage if your organization is not ready to commit to a larger scale investment in that space. Uh, having the engagement in those things first keep you connected to the whole ecosystem, but also it might be end up to the scenario that you actually come up with the business case or the community support uh, motivation that say, well, it, the, one of the ways for us is not to actually create a new data co-op, but also join the existing one. So I think from both of those angles, there are ways to actually communicate. And then let's keep in touch. I think that's probably the best way to go. Uh, as Jane mentioned, we are just kind of started to open the door. So last year for us was mainly working behind a closed door with the trusted partners, close partners, trying to really understand that what this platform is and how it's going to work. So now it's got to the level that now we are more open to the kind of new ideas and new uh, and you venture in that space. So yes, we, we, we are happy to actually work with you. Yeah, and I would just say, um, I do, I agree that it can seem like uh, bewildering. Um, so do just get in touch if you wanna have a side conversation. Um, and yeah, we are, we're trying to produce um, the data projects that we've been doing as reports. Um, so there's quite a few of them now available through um, APO analysis and policy observatories, some of the different um, data experimental projects that we've been doing where you might get an idea about some of the uh, visualizations that are, can be done and that and this sort of data sets and what can be done with the data sets and that kind of thing. Right. Um, Amir just shared the Twitter handle and we can also share some links in the follow up email with the survey. Uh, link. So I'll get some of those from you, Amir, and I'll send that to everyone. Yep. Um, we don't have any more questions. Is there anything either of you would like to add? Well, uh, I think um, basically from, from this point on, uh, you know, the data co-op platform is open for business. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a very, very tacky term from the business people, <laughs> but in that sense, we actually at the point of starting looking at some of the data co-ops that are not just for individual stakeholders, but it's for the larger communities. And open data co-ops play an important role in this. One of our projects in this space that right now we are exploring is the impact of bushfire. And things like this, the projects that actually has a, a high impact for large communities, there is a more likely that uh, there's a highly chance that we can actually find sponsors for those projects. So if you have an idea about data co-op that can be in a way beneficial to the larger communities, let us know, that would be often great help. Great, I'll add your email address to that email yes. list yeah. everyone. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Anything to add, Jane, or we'll wrap no, up? Just Thank everyone for, for being here. And um, as I said, yeah, just get in touch if you want any follow up chat. Great. Thank you so much to Jane and Amir for being here today and presenting and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, and thank you to all of our participants. We've really enjoyed having you and I hope you can catch another Impact 2020 webinar. We'll end the uh, webinar there. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.